Australia. I've been in Portugal now for 28 years. Um, I had a bit of a checkered career. I started up in the, in the port region. I made fortified with the Simington Group for about 10 years. Um, started a few Duro table wine projects like Kinder de Crasto and Kinder de la Rosa. And in 1992, I went down to, down to the Alentasia to head up uh, the winemaking at Hedard de Chaparral, which is a very big uh, estate um, based in the Alentasia region of Portugal. Awesome. So, David, take us back a little bit. You started in Australia. How did you, how did you discover wine? How did you realize that it was a passion of yours and something that you wanted to, uh, to get involved with in the winemaking process? Um, I've, I've always been lucky. You know? I, I'm one of these guys that, that tend, things tend to work out well for me. I'm, I have to admit that I've been very lucky. Um, and the first part of the luck was that I happened to grow up in the Barossa Valley, which is a wine region in, in, in South Australia. Very famous wine region. And my family weren't in wine. I just kind of fell into it. Um, I just liked the idea of becoming a winemaker after I finished high school. And the Enology School was nearby, so it was kind of an easy thing to gravitate into. Although, at the time, uh, winemaking in Australia wasn't uh, uh, the successful business that it, uh, that it turned out to be during the 90s and until recently, anyway. So it was a bit of a it was a bit of a reckless thing to do in the 70s. I'm talking about 1973 when I first started doing winemaking and I started winemaking in Australia. There wasn't this great wine industry in Australia waiting to uh, give you a stellar career in winemaking. So basically, I, I did the course. I became I was, became qualified um, and. A large part of the course I really enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed the European viticultural part of it because there wasn't much about Australia that we, we could learn. So um, I went to Europe after I finished my course in 1978 and I, in, I, I worked vintages in France and Germany. And, um, and after I'd done that, I went into Portugal for a holiday, basically. And uh, there must have been some kind of an ambush or a setup or something because I met my wife to be on the beach uh, in Lisbon. And um, that kind of that kind of changed my life uh, pretty significantly, really. Um, I wasn't at that stage ready to stay in Portugal, though, so I went back to Australia because I wanted to work in the Barossa as a winemaker and get my get my uh, teeth into something in, in, in Australia first. So I went back. She followed me back later a few months when she got a visa to, to go to Australia. And eventually we, met, we got married in Australia. I spent about three years in the Barossa Valley making wines for a company called Saltram. Which, which, is, which was later on absorbed by Mildara Blass and is now no longer uh, producing wine. But it was one of these classic old Australian wineries at the time. It was a great place for me to get a, a good uh, grounding, a good experience. Um, and uh, eventually my wife kind of got a bit uh, homesick for Portugal and I thought, okay, I'll go back and see what happens. And, and uh, I was lucky again, you know, I got to, I couldn't find the right job in the early phases. So I'm talking about the early 80s. There wasn't much happening in the table wine field in Portugal in the early 80s. So I worked in the port trade for, that, for the first 10 years. And then in the early 90s, that's when I went to Sparrow and started up a lot of projects in Maduro and now Sparrow. And, you know, everything's kind of fallen into place over the last uh, 18, 20 years. Yeah. Gotcha. So, like you just mentioned, you know, Portuguese table wine really hasn't been something that's been popular for a very long time, but all of a sudden it's really taken off and it's sort of exploded. Um, for people who aren't familiar with it, talk a little bit about the style of wine that you're making in the Alentejo and, uh, and maybe some of the grapes that you're using to make them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if, if I wanted to simplify it, and it's, very, it's a very much a generalization, I'd say we're using new world wine techniques, um, but with old, old world grape varieties, okay? So that that sort of sums up the appeal of what we're doing at Esperel and in the Alentasia in general because the Alentasia climate is very similar to parts of Australia that I know. It's not unlike the Barossa Valley, for example. Um, so we get the grapes nice and ripe uh, for a start and if we apply good winemaking techniques, uh, you know, uh, temperature control, fermentation, good hygiene and, and more and more it's also understanding the vineyard better um, as you, the longer you spend in a, in a project, a, a winemaking project, um, there's not that much about the winemaking process that it differs from country to country these days. I mean, the, the technology is there for everybody to, 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 to use, to apply. So where you, where, you, where you really make the difference now is in the vineyard. Um, and there's no, there's no secret now that the, the, the major advances in terms of winemaking, the quality of wines that are being produced has to do with how you look after your fruit in the vineyard. 
So uh, again, with Esperal, I've been there for, for 20 years now. I know I know where our best fruit is. Um, we don't handle all our vineyards in the same way because we've got 500 hectares. So some of it, what we're trying to, we can have more production for grapes that are going into Mont Value. And all our top wines, the Esperal line and the Mono Varietal line, we spend time in the vineyard. We do a lot of crop thinning. We make sure our canopy management is, is well done so we get good aeration and we don't have, we have very little disease uh, control because it's a very dry climate so we hardly have to spray. So the wines turn out to be very natural because uh, that's how we grow our grapes. Um, and uh, yeah, I, and we, I think we've got a, a good hand on how we use oak as well. We don't, we don't overdo the oak thing. I, mean, we, I think we saw that in the tasting today that people have kind of appreciated the fact that the oak is quite soft, quite discreet and uh, that's been something that, that uh, we've, we've kind of pioneered a bit in, in, uh, in the plantation as well. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that they're, they're very subtle in their style and they're not over the top, not a whole ton of oak, which, uh, which makes them food friendly, of course. Yeah. Is there a certain food and wine pairing that you like out of the line of the Esperio wine, something that really stands out to you that works really well together? You mean in Portugal? Uh, I guess. Yeah, 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 with the yeah. Portuguese cuisine. Yeah, um, well, Portuguese cuisine is pretty varied. Um, you know, uh, everything from... I mean, the beauty of Portugal is just uh, fresh fish from the sea that you throw on a griller and have it with a nice, fresh, uh, clean white wine, say, from, from, the, from the menu. Uh, Alvarinho's from, from, uh, from the menu are fantastic with uh, that sort of thing. In, in the Alentejo, the wines are more spicy and uh, they can handle more elaborate kind of dishes, you know, like uh, fish from the oven uh, with some sort of more... Um, Slightly more complicated sauces and things to go with, with fish, that kind of thing. And then with that, you can use either white or red. Uh, you know, the whitest brow that's been barrel fermented or the red brow that's been aged, they go equally well with, with fish, you know, which is a bit of a something a little bit new. But we're, we're quite happy to have, uh, we've always had. We always use red wine as an accompaniment for bacalhau. Bacalhau is the codfish that we have in Bush, which is quite kind of famous. And uh, that's always there's always been a natural connection with red wine with, with bacalhau. Um, otherwise, there's some really interesting dishes like uh, um, um, pound the pork alentejano, which is um, pork meat with uh, clams, and that's, that that works really well with the spicy kind of red red wines that we make in Alentejo. So. Um, the, the, uh, without being too specific about it, uh, the great thing about the Alentejo in particular, the wines, because they're very well balanced and, um, and the oak is, is quite discreet, they're not too tannic, they have good acidity, they're very versatile, so you can use them in a wide range of uh, you know, food, they're very food friendly. Great, great. Well, uh, well David, thank you so much for your time, and you know, based on the tasting here tonight, it's obvious that the wines were really well received, so hopefully we, uh, we can encourage some people to go out and, and discover the Alentejo. Okay, well, I hope I get the chance to come back and do it again. Great, thank you.